Hey there, it's Nathan Crane again, founder of the Panacea Community and executive producer of Unify Fest. And I'm really grateful you're continuing to join us for the second annual Self-Reliance Summit. You know, the summit is really about empowering each of us to live closer to the land, develop new skills of self-reliance and interdependence and community connectedness, as well as live a more sustainable and harmonious life. And today on the summit, we're really excited to be joined by Maryam Hanin. Maryam is the director of the award-winning documentary Vanishing of the Bees. Maryam's also worked on programs for the BBC, Discovery, Robert Greenwald, and Morgan Spurlock. Her articles have appeared in several publications, including Los Angeles Times, Maxim, Science and Spirit magazine, as well as Penthouse. And Maryam's near-death experience also raised her awareness of the environment, which inspired her to work on a piece on the Exxon Valdez oil spill for Robert Greenwald and the Sierra Club. And shortly thereafter, the bees began flying into her life. And through HoneyColony.com, Maryam has fused her reporting skills with her love of nutrition and social media in a cooperative model that closely resembles the workings of a real hive. So, Maryam, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Nathan. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So, you know, I want to dive right into CCD and colony collapse disorder. Um, how far have we come in identifying the truths about what's really happening to the bees? I think that we've come a, a long way since this first hit the news in 2007. I, I tell people that, you know, back then it was a mystery and the bees were mysteriously disappearing. And now the only mystery is why is this still considered a mystery? It's pretty uh, well established now that systemic pesticides are the root cause of colony collapse disorder. And since the release of the film, I've continued doing activism and, and researching and covering this topic. Here we are in 2016, and the poster boy for colony collapse disorder, David Hackenberg, lost about 90% of his hives. I'm smiling, but it's, it's not funny at all. So we're about a decade later, and the issue is still ongoing and is now in other parts, continues to spread in other parts of the world. So for instance, I was in Greece last year and they also have systemic pesticides and they have colony collapse. However, it's it's harder to, to pinpoint one because they're not, this is kind of new. And two, there's so much uh, terrain in, in Greece that you can take the bees that have been exposed and put them in a field and then they will recover and then no one will really know that they were impacted by systemic pesticides. So that's kind of on a negative note. On a positive note, I, I tell people that bees are on the forefront of our consciousness more than ever before and that there's this huge um, surge in urban beekeeping all over the world, whether it's San Francisco or Montreal or Los Angeles or Paris. And so that's a positive thing. Um, so, yeah, that's no, it's a huge, it's a, it's a hugely positive thing. And, and I do see more people getting excited to, you know, have bees and especially honeybees. Um, but going back a little bit, because I remember, you know, hearing the buzz about colony collapse disorder. And, and when I heard it, it was somewhere in had to be in 2010 or, or maybe 2009, somewhere in that time frame. And I started researching it and watching films and, you know, even ex experiencing some really incredible experiences of my own with the bees, connecting with the bees. And, um, you know, it was pretty clear to me at that time that, uh, you know, the pesticides, the toxins, chemicals, pollutants, etc., are definitely negatively affecting the bees. The confusion oftentimes is a lot of these seeds are um, treated with systemic pesticides. They're Monsanto seeds, yeah. but that's it's not Monsanto, not, not 
you know, I know everyone loves to hate them, but it's also important to get the facts straight. Mm -hmm. So these are coded seeds and uh, the companies responsible for systemic pesticides, which are the most popular pesticides in the world, are systemics, neonicotinoids, so nicotine-based neurotoxins. And they had a ban that has since expired in Europe. And they no noticed that there was an upswing or there was a, a kind of a revival, for lack of a better word, of the bees right? Um, because of, of banning this. And so let's say in America, we're, we're trying hard to have that occur, but these companies have so much sway, um, monetary sway, that it's, it's difficult. What, so what, what's the name of the, because I thought it was Monsanto that also owned the, the, the chemical company too. No, it's a different company. No, it's Bayer, Crop oh, Science. Oh, Bayer, that's right. Yes, and yes. Syngenta. Okay. And, and I have a couple of articles that, that make that distinction, distinction and, and clarify that it's Bayer and, and not Monsanto. And so coming around to, to where I was going with my question is what are some of the data that you've seen, hard studies that you've seen that is directly signifying or indicating that, you know, these systemic pesticides are directly causing colony collapse disorder? Well, there's um, several, uh, th there's one consortium that has gathered all the um, information studies. Uh, when we were making the film, we were kind of on the fringe and, and cutting edge in, in our conclusion. Since then, there are studies out of Harvard, um, out of Purdue, out of Europe. Um, there's, there's tons of them. I, if you need links or you want links, I can provide you with them. Um, if you're, are you looking for some hard facts? I mean, they, these, these systemic pesticides have been shown now that they're in our water system. Mm -hmm. They um, stay in the earth and the metabolites are often more dangerous than the actual parent compound. We have seen that it it impacts and harms other pollinators across the board. So hummingbirds, monarchs, other native bees, bats, so on and so forth. And um, it's also been shown that that it harms the the human brain. So I mean, these this is serious serious uh, stuff. And so so just to to explain very quickly it, that. These systemics are coated in the seed or entrenched in the soil. So what happens is that it becomes part of the plant. And so the bees will go and collect the nectar and the, and the pollen and go back to the hive and store them. So it doesn't impact the, the immediate generation. And bees are constantly regenerating. The queen lays about 2,500 eggs a day. So you don't see it immediately. And that's part of the insidious nature of these pesticides is that it's very difficult to pinpoint, right? Just like with someone with an autoimmune. Sorry, there's a plane. Is, that, is it okay? It's okay. So it's very hard to pinpoint. Just like with autoimmune, there's all these variables. And so it, that works to the advantage of the pesticide company. So, so now looking at 2016, it's, it's acceptable and, and recognized that at the root cause are these systemic pesticides because they're compromising the immune system of the honeybee. And so, therefore, they're not able to fight off pathogens or viruses or mites as they normally would because their immune system is compromised. And so, when I'm sharing information to people, I, I suffer from an autoimmune condition. And I tell people that just like the honeybees are environmental indicators, so are people that are suffering from autoimmune because we're a lot more sensitive. So I can walk into a room and be offended by some chemical smell that the average person can't pick up. And that's because it exists. I mean, everything is interconnected. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean that it's not affecting us or it's not existing. So it is mainstream and accepted now, I believe. However, with that said, there are still a lot, there's still a lot of disinformation that's being spread. And they're always undermining the systemic pesticides. So even the chemical companies, for instance, they even target children in schools like Bayer, crop science um, and 
they always say, this is hurting the bees, this is hurting the bees, like a lack of um, uh, ha habitat, a uh, loss of diversity in, in the habitat, and, or these mites, or other other things, but they're always undermining it. And yes, everything is involved, and it's it's a complicated, but at the root is the compromising of this immune system by these systemic pesticides. Well, and that, you know, looking at maybe some of the other um, other issues that are directly affecting the health of the bees too. Um, I mean, for example, beekeepers that, that use sugar water instead of honey to feed the bees. If you could only imagine, I mean, their life source is the honey and you replace that, which is a complete protein, right? It has all the essential amino acids. It is, uh, I mean, you could almost live on honey, even as a human, <laughs> and that's like the life source of the bee, and replacing that with... That, that and pollen. Pollen and, is the one that has the amino acids and the protein. The pollen, exactly, and um, and replacing that with sugar water, you know, yes. so that, and then you're adding on the pesticides and the chemicals, you're adding on, you know, the pollution in, in the surrounding environment, you're adding on the stress of hauling these bees across the country to... And the monocultures and also. And then the, the monocultures, the, the almond the fields. The, the fact that they're not able to eat a variety, they're, let's say, blueberries for four weeks or almonds for four weeks. And so that coupled with the stress of trucking them. But my point is that we've been trucking bees for a long time, not that that's a sustainable model either, right. but that's not the cause of colony collapse disorder. When we're talking about the colony collapse and, the, and the, the bees just disappear in a short amount of time and, and can't be found. And then I also tell people that a honeybee is, is not able to survive for more than 24 hours without her hive. And so if a bee is, is uh, kind of has like this Alzheimer's and is in this monoculture where everything looks the same and can't get back home, then she, she dies. And it's also kind of a, a, a beautiful way of seeing how the hive and the superorganism is so necessary for to exist and how we can learn from that of how the bees cooperate for the greater good and work selflessly and have been used as an example throughout the ages for so many things that they can teach us, just even industriousness and, and the ability to, to work together. Yeah, that, I mean, that's such a beautiful point. Um, and um, something that I'm just reminded of uh, when I did an interview with um, uh, a Mason bee expert for our documentary series, on The Search for Sustainability. And, um, you know, he specifically works with Mason bees or, or um, solidar, uh, uh, solidarity bees, right? And so the interesting thing that they find with, like, Mason bees, for example. Um, solitary, yeah. Solitary, yes. I couldn't think of the word. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those days. <laughs> yeah. Um, solitary bees, like mason bees, is that, you know, if they take them to a monoculture field that's been sprayed with pesticides, for example, they leave. You know, they don't have a hive to hold them down. And so they, mm -hmm. they leave, and that's why, like, these large, like, he's trying to work with larger farms, encouraging them to go organic and to have diversity and not to use pesticides because these bees are such efficient pollinators, mason bees. I mean, they're extremely more efficient at pollinating than, than honeybees, for example, but they will not stay. They don't have a hive to stay at, so they don't have to stay, so they leave, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's an example of, of, a, of a species, of similar species that goes to an environment that isn't required to stay there that will leave, and then we're seeing the same thing happening with the honeybees where they just vanish, right? yes. even though they have a hive, but it seems like they try to stick around as long as they possibly can um, until they can't do it anymore, right? Yeah, and I mean, we, we, if we're spiritual beings or, or are at least aware of a, another dimension that's not tangible, we, we don't know. I mean, I, I, I kind of tease and say, oh, they're going to like the fourth and fifth dimension or I tell people, oh, you know, the, the organic beekeepers, they've never experienced the bees disappearing. The bees are still there. Right. So there's this reverence this uh, respect that we've completely lost in um, modern modern ag agriculture, this this disconnection uh, to to the earth, and this automation of of just more uh, better yield. I mean, look at look at our food supply. It's um, you know a lot of times I could 
come across as sounding conspiratorial, um, but but honestly, the more I dive into this this uh, rabbit hole that compromises of health and well-being and and uh, the way we farm, th there's um, we're poisoning ourselves. What, what can I say? It's just um, it, it's atrocious. Even like just in in foods themselves, uh, do people really scrutinize labels and and see the other things that they add to it to really compromise the value of, of the food. I think we need to be really discerning and to have critical thinking um, switched on when, when we're putting food and buying food that we put into our bodies. Yeah, it's a good point. And, it, you know, going back to something you said a minute ago about learning from the bees and how they live together and work together in collaboration and perfect harmony, I think there's a really amazing woman um, who we also interviewed who I got to spend mm. some time with, uh, Jacqueline Freeman, mm. who um, has spent years just sitting with the bees in meditation, observing, learning from them. And all of a sudden she started receiving information and put, and put a book together, you know. And um, a book is really fascinating because um, it kind of speaks from the perspective of, of the bees. And, and, you know, if you look at the bees, I mean, you could have thousands, even tens of thousands flying around each other at extreme speeds and not a single one ever run into each other. It's like they know right where they're at. They're always working together. They're always going out and searching for food to bring back to the hive without really expecting anything in return. The other thing that was, in, that was interesting, I thought, was... Um, like if a bee is is uh, sick or it recognizes mm. it's sick or is, um, mm. you know, decrepit or dying or something mm -hmm. like that and it goes to the hive and the little guard bees there at the front are like, hey, we can't let you in. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're not doing well. You're going to infect the hive. That bee often, if you observe, will voluntarily leave and yeah. go off and just like, okay, it's my time to leave, you know, and it, yep. it transcends the physical world. I think it's fascinating because it's that it's that co-creative, collaborative, like let's work together for the greater good um, scenario yeah. mindset versus this competitive we versus them who's got the most money, the biggest corporation or biggest house or whatever, right? It's like, yeah, we can learn a lot from them in that way. And and, and we see this, this paradigm shift. I mean, there's like, I feel like right now there's people who are asleep and who are part of the matrix and who are just business as usual, stapled to their desk, just on automated, just autom automatic mode um, and automatic pilot. Or there's people who are waking up and wanting to be part of the solution and realizing that all these systems need to collapse. So in a way, like in our film, we, we say that in a way, CCD is a blessing in disguise. We have learned so much since then, and the bees right. have opened our eyes, and they are ancient messengers. And we're really um, taking a look and reassessing the way our health system, our education system, I mean, all of these systems are just archaic and need to just be dismantled, and then new comes, new comes around. So... I feel like the bees flying into my life and I have had myself so many magical experiences with them that there's no doubt in my mind that there's something else that's going on that, that is not uh, tangible or inexplainable. Um, they are definitely magical creatures that we can learn from. So let, let's, that, that leads me to my next question. Um, what happens? So you had this near death experience. It, it woke you up, it opened your eyes, opened your heart, taught you about medicine, nutrition, uh, related to the honeybees. What happened? Share that story, if you will. Sure. So I'm, I'm originally from Canada. So where I come from, I, I grew up inherently having health care. So I was 29 at the time, which is you can argue Saturn return. I don't know if you know about astrology. In any case, I was crossing the street and... Uh, got hit by a Ford Explorer going at 40 miles an hour. I consider myself, it's a miracle that I'm here and walking. Um, so I had a metal rod placed in my femur and broke um, like five ribs and my L1 and my tailbone. And, um, and I didn't have health insurance. So, um, and that's actually one of the first things I said while lying on the ground, um, someone came to, to my 
to my rescue and, and I told them I don't have insurance. Um, and then slowly I realized and just it really opened my mind to Western medicine, which I think is excellent when it comes to surgeries, doling out drugs and running tests. Then I, you know, but, but I really had to myself um, heal myself and look into alternative medicine. And that's really when I jumped down the rabbit hole and I was looking a whole host of health issues happened, which I really opened my eyes and, and started studying alternative medicine. And then I was looking for a project to give back, uh, to be in service. And, and this notion of service, I don't think also a lot of people really understand what it means to be in, in service, which is just... Yeah, it, it's it's obvious. Just you be in service, and but but knowing that you're taken care of and that you're helping others, and the bees also taught me that. But anyway, so I was looking for a project, and like I said, the bees uh, literally flew into my life. Um, I started having bee visitations slowly, um, shortly after George Langworthy, my co-director told me, you know, I think this would make a good project. The bees are disappearing. And then when I started looking into it and I was really drawn to the fact that it's a sacred, um, sacred feminine and it's a, um, it's a sister society, 90% plus of the, of the hive are female. Um, and so that began on my journey. And then while making the film and spending a lot of time outside with farmers and then finding out, oh my goodness, what, what are they doing to our food supply? Um, so that, that's, and, and then after that, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, which I think a lot, now if you, if you, it's pretty common knowledge that if you have, um, a trauma of some sort, it can trigger your body into fight or flight, and then you can develop a whole host of autoimmune. And, um, I mean, I can start talking about that, but that's like a, a different, a different topic, um, I don't know if that if I answered your your question about what happened, but yeah, well, it's it is. I mean, talking about health, obviously, health is so directly related and interrelated with the mm. bees and the health of the bees and the food and how it you know the food we put into our body and the air we breathe, because they're putting the same food into their bodies in in one way or another as they're collecting the pollen and and. Uh, you know, drink, you know, that, so, um, talking about health too, I mean, just wanting to expand what you said about Western medicine, because I also, mm -hmm. you know, went through a whole healing crisis myself and been on a, a healing, uh, health, uh, journey for about 10 years now and have had the okay. opportunity to, to interview and, and research and study and experiment with, you know, diets, cleanses, detoxes, uh, you name it. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's been fascinating and, you know, I learn a lot, but same thing. Yeah. Western medicine. It's like, I, I, um, I think it was Mike Adams who first said this, it made the most sense to me that like, if we really want a medical system here in the West that is effective and in integrity and honest and really about helping people, not about making billions or trillions yeah. of dollars, it, yeah. has, it has to be a not-for-profit system. And, yeah. if, and if it were a not-for-profit system, doctors got paid fairly, but not tens of millions, right? Because it's, it's one of those things, like education, for mm -hmm. example, that should be a service initiative, a service work to the world, service to people. And like you said, being of service is one of the greatest gifts we have. As we learn to find out what we're passionate about and how we can help other people, um, it you know it comes back to you tenfold uh, as you live your life in service to others, you know without expectations, and so the healthcare industry you know I feel like it needs to be a not-for-profit system as well as an integrative system so that like you said the conventional medicine the surgery etc it's there for extreme care it's there for you know acute situations but for chronic situations autoimmune disorder you know that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Um, cancer, diabetes, etc. That is all, you know, that's food, that's herbs, that's exercise, that's diet, that's lifestyle, that's meditation. It's all these other things we call alternative, which really should be primary care. Um, in my yeah, uh, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think the more you do research and you find out about the AMA and the FDA and the CDC and the WHO, and these are businesses. I mean, the WHO, the the person who runs it uh, is, is loaded, makes tons of cashola. Um, they disperse 
misinformation. And it's so layered and so nuanced and it's very difficult to come against the establishment without being ridiculed or pinpointed. Um, but there's no doubt that they are run by money. And even just cancer is an, is an industry and is full of misinformation on what cancer really is and how to treat it. And just historically, anytime there's been a natural remedy that has worked, it's been shut down. Um, now that I run Honey Colony, which the whole thrust of it is one, to put honesty back into the food supply and to empower people to be their own best health advocate. All day long, uh, there's, cause there's people who are reaching out um, in desperation, in massive pain and don't have the answers and have been effed over by Western medicine and are lost. And they also honestly underestimate the power of diet and um, maybe not they're not ready or realize the impact of changing their diet to really heal themselves so I have people who are like well this product helped me well it's not like first of all I can't give you any diagnosis over live chat and uh, it's not one product that's going to make your life better it's right. a holistic holistic plan and it starts with our food and what we put in our system absolutely impacts us and Hipp Hippocrates was correct when he said food is thy medicine and now food is thy poison what can I say um unless you're scrutinizing and you really know. Um, and having also, like you, gone through detox, detoxes and cleanses and so on and so forth, I think the one take-home is make sure that you're eating real food and make sure that it's organic. Every body is different. So let's say someone like me, I don't eat, I can't eat dairy, I don't eat gluten, I don't eat sugar. It's been way more than 10, 10 years. I don't drink alcohol. There's not much that I can eat. So let's say someone like me, I do eat meat occasionally and I have to make sure that it's organic and, and um, been, the animal has been um, treated with respect. But I feel that we should move beyond, let's say, judgments. Um, I, I support veganism. I support raw, raw food. But I think every person should eat for themselves. And the most important thing, like I said, is to eat real, real food. Well, and, and, you know, bringing that back to the bees, um, the more that you eat organic, the more that we support organic farmers, the more that we buy from local organic farmers, farmers markets, etc., the more you're supporting the bees because the bees are getting access to these organic fields, these organic crops and not being, you know, polluted with these chemicals as well. So, I mean, it, it's it's quite amazing to think about that, um, whatever gases, whatever things we're putting into the environment, especially into the air right now, within 18 months or less, it is already expanded to the entire planet's atmosphere. So whether, yeah. whether we're smoking or we're polluting or putting toxins or, or what have you, you know, through chemical agriculture, through, you know, all these different things we're doing, um, literally will <laughs> reach somebody else's lungs across the world in at least 18 months or less. So that, I mean, it's that direct impact that every choice yeah. we have actually has on every other living being in the world. Um, yes. You know, it makes it very tangible. And, and yes, I mean, I agree. It's like we, when we're at home, we eat like 90% plus organic. And, yes. um, um, you know, if you're smart, it doesn't have to be more expensive. If you're, if you're a smart shopper, you know, if you're, the more packaged stuff you buy organic, the more expensive it is. But like bananas, for example, maybe 20 cents more or 10 cents more than, than you know, bananas that are grown with pesticides. You yeah, know, I that... don't even look at the prices anymore. Exactly. I don't make a lot of money and I tell people rather buy superfoods than shoes. Yeah. I spend my money on food. I like going into the health food store. When I go traveling, that's the first place I go to kind of get my bearings and get grounded is is a health food store that, that gets – you know that makes me me happy and i think that also the bees um the bees also teach us you know to be the change that every little um if you think that your impact or your decisions have no consequences that is absolutely not true um it takes let's say a bee lives 6 weeks in her 6 week lifespan she will only make a quarter of a teaspoon of honey so you when you look at a jar of honey you see that's cooperation right there that's impact that's everyone making a little difference so if you do one thing even a one gesture a day 
that's good for your body, that makes an impact. Uh, and it's good to remind us that because let's say someone again with an autoimmune condition, it's an onslaught. You know, I can, I can walk into an AT&T store and be assaulted by their, like it was a new store and I was completely assaulted by the chemicals. It's it, The store is off-gassing, basically. They just laid out the carpet and, you know, the next door person will be like, oh, that's the new store smell. They like it. <laughs> completely oblivious. Um, so... Every little, my point is, every little gesture does make a difference. We may not see it, but um, it does. It does add up, and we need to empower one another and work together like a community, instead of like this is mine, that's yours. Um, and I think that that's difficult to teach. I think people, a lot of people, were, were programmed. We have imprints, and change uh, oftentimes is is threatening to the self because that means they have to reconsider everything in their sphere and that's just too much and they just push it away and unfortunately a lot of times tragedy is the only thing that forces us to make a change and I'm hoping to spread the knowledge so that it doesn't have to come to, to that extent. Oh, I, I get to see the bees um, just spotted a bee out, outside the, the window. Nice. Which nice. nice. I actually just got beehives coming uh, next week so getting ready to get our bees going here in Santa Fe as well. And, um, you know, you, you brought Hopefully a, not a flow hive, right? Oh, no, no. Actually, I, who did I talk to? We did an interview. We talked to... Oh, I think Justin talked about that. And it's... Um, what's your take on that? My take is, you know, it's, it, it, it doesn't seem right to me. Um, it seems like, you know, taking advantage of the bees, getting rid of the human connection, the human interaction, you know, it's fabricated material. I mean, I don't want to put it down. I, I like the fact that it's encouraging people to want to have and support bees, but then again, it's mechanizing them and, you know, um, I don't know. What's your take on it? I, I'll just say that the story that I wrote, uh, three reasons to go against the flow hive is the most, um, visited uh, article on honey colony wow. the um, the comments are astounding I lay out um, anyway my point was to to invite debate and inspire critical thinking and I'm not into the flow hive at first I think a lot of people are like oh wow right. but it basically turns the beehive into uh, like a keg of beer like oh honey on tap yeah. and now all of a sudden now you give a crap about the bees because you can get honey from them that's like the least the last reason I want to have bees I just want them around and it's a joy and an honor in my opinion honestly so that's just an extra if, if I cultivate the honey from, from my bees. So I'm, I'm not into it. And again, I'm, it's not about putting the people down or, or saying that they're bad. or um, It's just questioning. Uh, I, I'm, I, I mean, I don't have bees right now, but when I had my bees, I, I didn't. Uh, I just let them be and I just was happy to have them. So you can read the story on the flow high bell. All I say is like, as I said, it's, it's, uh, the comments have been, um, vitriolic to say, um, uh, against my position. Mm, yeah. Well, and that, you know, any real kind of organic beekeeper I've ever talked to who really is, is keeping bees because, you know, they, they want to be of service to the bees. Um, and, and yes. they all, I mean, I've heard that from so many beekeepers that, yeah, honey is like, it's like the reward. It's like the, you know, a, a, yeah. an amazing honor, a benefit for being of great service to the bees. It's not like, oh, I'm keeping bees to get honey. It's like keeping bees. And some, bee, you know, a lot of beekeepers start that way. Yeah, I want honey. But they, they grow affection and reverence for the bees in the process, which I find very fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, you know, the other piece of that, what... Uh, what's coming to mind is how they share that that human interaction with the bees that connection that you know lifting communing you're the communing. communing yeah the speaking with the you know it's like my first experience with with bees was um my first kind of real experience with communing with bees was we had this feral beehive about eight feet up in the side of a two slat fence um, behind our house and um they had a massive hive built in there and and I was just observing them day after day, and, and I really wanted to know, like, do bees actually want us to take their honey? Are they, like, 
cool with it? Like, do they like it? You know? And so I just, I just sat in meditation with them for a few days. Then I felt the, um, the calling to go and, and, uh, and, and take some honey. And as I did, you know, I can't, I couldn't see inside the hive. Number one, number two, I had no suit, no mask, no smoke, no nothing, just t-shirt on. Mm -hmm. Um, and number three, as I was reaching my hand in and I swarmed, you know, thousands of bees on my arm, um, not a single one was stinging me. And I felt like this, almost this joy and this happiness from the bees, like, oh, somebody's, mm -hmm. you know, loving and accepting this great work that we've done. We're happy to share it with you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as long as you don't take too much, you know, we need it for ourselves too. And I, you know, took a piece of comb off and brought it down. I was all covered in bees. And, you know, it was such a, a beautiful experience for me to recognize, like, these beings that most people are very afraid of, right? Oh, no, yeah. honey, be get off, be get off. You see people yeah, like yeah, at them. Yes. I'm always like, no, don't do that. You know? Yes. Um, it's imprinting. It's just from their childhood. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. Or they've had a, a negative um, experience. But, but uh, it, unless they're like Africanized bees. Um, right. I mean, I'm sure you, you saw the picture with the bees all over me, which yeah. I, I, I did to show that you can communi commune with bees and they can sense fear and you have to emanate love. And I ask, let's say, permission if I'm near a hive and want to taste the honey or the pollen um and i have people that that reach out and and are like bees why are you using why are you selling in the, any of their products and i know all the vendors that and i know that they're doing it with integrity and i, I bee products the, whether it's the propolis or the royal jelly or the venom or the pollen or the honey it's all medicine it's yeah. medicine yeah. and it's sacred and so if i'm ingesting bee products i see it as medicine and i i'm yeah i i as long as you have some respect i, I think it's okay yeah That's, you, i mean you know and the, i not to um encourage people to go out and start sticking their hands in wild you know wild beehives uh, because i don't encourage people to do it but it was an experiment for me and a learning experience i mean the other side of that too is i i, I accidentally took too much the bees fell and I got stung a dozen times, you know. So I've had both experiences of that as teaching, learning experiences mm -hmm. from the bees. But, but yes, I mean, um, these are all great points. And, um, you know, what are, some, what are some other things people can do in their own life and way that they're living to help the, the bees to flourish? Yes, they can do a lot of things. They can... <clears throat> do things like go to farmers market and support whether it's a local your local beekeeper or just local farmers obviously eat organic if you have chemicals in your under your sink uh, you may want to dispose of them in a respectful way you can watch the film you can share the film with someone else we also have an educational version for grades four th through 12 or 11 um, with a study guide that inspires critical thinking. Uh, we just say be, be the change. So what other, what other things? I mean, voting with your fork is, is huge. Um, and I think education is huge uh, as the two, two main points. Um, yeah. And so the film, Vanishing of the Bees, best place to, for folks to get that? They can see it on Netflix. They can see it on iTunes. It's been translated now in 13 languages, which is exciting. Um, it's been shown around the world. And it's, it, unfortunately, I tell people that, you know, typically a um, documentary has a certain, you know, quote unquote, shelf life. And that unfortunately, the bees, because the bees are still dying, our, our film is still very much alive and, and relevant. And, um, now there's a pretty big mo movement and it's kind of like say main, mainstream in, in the sense that there's been other movies and there's campaigns all over the place and uh, I think it's more, I would hope by now people know at, at the very least they know that the bees are disappearing, they may not know why but um, there's still a lot of education that needs to be done. I think that if we look at where we were in our consciousness from 2007, when it comes to the food supply and the movement and where we are now, that, that we are making progress. Uh, it's going to take time because we're, it's like David and Goliath. 
Um, however, that we still we need to continue to make noise and to be a community and uh, be the change that we want to see and believe that things are changing for, for the better. It really depends on what we focus our attention on. And I say that because I, uh, I spend my days uh, every day kind of looking at, uh, for lack of a better word, n negative things that are happening. And it's definitely impacted my psyche. And uh, it's good to focus on positive things and to be in a community where people are making um, a difference. Like, for instance, last year I traveled to Central America and spent about three weeks uh, getting my permaculture certificate with lovely people that are all making a difference and they're aware. And, and permaculture is such an, a beautiful way. I mean, I don't think the name does justice to what it actually is. Right. But really looking at a holistic way of growing our food and uh, – taking into consideration the direction of the wind or uh, where the water source is, just taking in the lay of the land and, and optimizing it to work together. Um, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Obviously, beekeeping is very much part of permaculture. And so there's, there's so many people who are doing positive things, and um, that's, that's exciting. Yeah, mentioning permaculture, we have, uh, I think, four entire interviews now just about permaculture and, and various aspects of permaculture on the Self-Reliance Summit. So make sure you take nice. a look at those yes. for, for people watching. That's, uh, Paul Wheaton is one. Okay. Um, let's see, Justin Rhodes um, and uh, a couple of others. I have to go back and look, but they're fascinating conversations. Okay. Um, you know, permaculture is just coming up as like this, oh, Lori Neverman, also Paul Lenda, we talk about it. I think we have five interviews, actually, because permaculture is massive when you really look yes. at what it is. It's, people think of it just as food, but it's social systems, it's governance systems, it's building our, our dwellings, it's our connection with the land, it's even our spiritual connection uh, mm -hmm. can be looked at through the viewfinder of, of permaculture, so... Yeah, and um, all great things, all positive things people can do. And, and, and I would just add to it, you know, really consider um, if you have the land, if you're growing food, if you're, you know, or have a community farm get or something, bees. get bees and, and, and take care of them. Be of service to them. Learn to, you know, I waited like five years to get bees because I wanted to make sure that I was in a really good environment that I had the time, that I had the ability to to take care of them, to make sure they were taken care of, to mm -hmm. have good land for them and all of that. So, you know, n not necessarily rushing out just to get bees, because also it's like, you know, if we're going to have bees in an environment that's filled with pesticides and chemicals and stuff, maybe it's better not to have them there. I don't know. But, <laughs> but you know, just that relationship with the bees, I think, is very special. And um, Absolutely. And Absolutely. I think everyone should have it at uh, at some point, one way or another. Yes. So, yes. Uh, find, you know, closing things up here, a couple websites, also another website, um, or, or your main website is honeycolony.com, yes? Yes, yeah. please come and visit honeycolony.com. It's uh, full of amazing, uh, solid uh, articles that are informative, and, and like I say, I'm not a fan of cosmopolitan fluffy BS. That's not what you'll find. Um, and then we have really cutting edge uh, products that are simply transformative and that have been vetted. Um, most of the products that we sell, I know the vendors and I have a relationship with them and they're products that I personally have vetted and use. And so, you know, everything from, let's say, sunscreen, like for instance, Bayer, Crop Science, Bayer owns Coppertone now and mm. sunscreens are full of cancer giving properties um and so there's whenever whenever there is a product we really put a holistic campaign together to educate people it's not like let's say for instance another solution that we offer is um colloidal silver and so a lot of people may not know that um we're living in a very real uh, epidemic when it comes to antibiotic resistance they've been abused and misused so much that they're not really working anymore and if it, and we've breeded these superbugs so silver was a a natural antibiotic that was used and so for instance the saying born with a silver spoon is because the aristocracy could afford silver and it was very much a, a solution a natural antibiotic so we're trying to revive that and educate people so um yeah i invite you to 
to come take a look. We the tagline is um, where the hive decides what's healthy. Beautiful. Um, I, and I've I've read some articles and gone through the site, and it, you, you guys do an amazing job. I mean, it's high level, top notch quality information. So thank you. We'll put a link below this video for everybody awesome. for honeycolony.com. Take a look at that. Also, there's an upgrade button below this video if you missed any of the other interviews during the summit or you simply want to own them, you want to support our mission, you want to support the work that we're doing to uh, donate to other nonprofits who are doing this kind of great work in the world, and um, you want to be able to listen and watch these interviews uh, as many times as you want with lifetime ownership, check out the upgrade options. Um, and finally, I want to share with everyone tuning in, um, I want to invite you out to Unify Fest. Uh, Unify Fest is a four-day transformational festival we're producing here as an inaugural event in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It is a, uh, it's a festival that's dedicated to unifying humanity, celebrating life, and leaving the land better than we found it. So there's self-reliance workshops, making your own medicine, wild foraging, there's keynote presentations, there's live music all four days, there's yoga, there's ceremony of uh, multicultural diversities, indigenous elders coming from all over the world to do ceremony, there's fire ceremony. It's just, it, it's an wow. epic, epic party of transformational uh, uh, excitement goodness. and fun and goodness. And, and it's all about solutions. It's all about activism. It's all about empowering ourselves. And it's all about community. So it's come be a part of the hive, the hive at Unify Fest. Um, and we'll put a link below. Check that out, unifyfest.com. Um, other than that, Miriam, it's been a pleasure and an honor. I Thank love, you. Love Likewise. The work Thank that you. you do. I, saw your, I saw your film years ago when it first came out. And thought it was amazing and um, just, just love the work you do. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings. Yeah, blessings. And thank you all for tuning in. And uh, we'll talk to you next time on the Self-Reliance Summit. Take care. Mm -hmm.